und äh, macht dann auch auf Englisch weiter, äh, damit Sarg gut versteht, was ich erzähle, vor allem über ihn erzähle. Ähm, Erstmal äh, schön, dass ihr äh, so zahlreich äh, dass ihr so zahlreich äh, teilnehmt an dieser äh, coaching Clinic per Zoom. Ähm, ich äh, äh, kenne Sarg ja schon seit, äh, seit einigen Jahren. Äh, erzähle gleich ein bisschen mehr davon, wie wir uns kennengelernt haben. Ähm, und ich bin äh, super froh, äh, dass äh, er sich bereit gefunden hat, mit euch heute zu reden über äh, Spielerentwicklung und da insbesondere über die Entwicklung von Guards. Um, I'm going to continue now in, uh, in English um, so that everybody understands because we also have some foreign coaches uh, that are um, attending the clinic. So um, the idea of this clinic Uh, is that um, I think it's really important to share information and to be super transparent. Nobody has any secrets. Uh, and I think it's really important that um, we have super, super high level coaches uh, sharing their experiences and, and their knowledge and their know-how with our German coaches and especially the youth coaches. Um, The idea is to uh, do this kind of coaching clinic on a regular basis, like um, approximately uh, every two months or so, uh, we're going to have a clinic like that. And uh, we're going to bring in foreign know-how, uh, foreign expertise. Um, you've heard, you've all heard me uh, at clinics and Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you've heard all of our uh, national team coaches um, ad nauseum. So I think it's really important to bring in um, expertise and know-how from the outside. Um, and, and obviously, um, you know, Zach Guthrie uh, is an extremely, extremely bright basketball mind uh, I, I was uh, very fortunate uh, to meet him uh, when I spent like uh, two summers uh, with, with uh, the Utah Jazz. Uh, I still don't understand why they brought me in, but, uh, but uh, for me, it was great. Um, so at any rate, uh, when I was there, uh, I met Zach and, and we talked basketball um, on a pretty uh, regular basis. And... Uh, I must say, you know, when you talk to Zach about basketball, you feel pretty stupid because uh, he is such a brilliant, brilliant basketball mind uh, that it's sometimes almost intimidating to talk to him about the game that we all love. So, um, so you know, uh, I, I mean, I almost want to want to call him a friend, uh, and 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 that is why. You know, I asked him to come on and, and speak to you, uh, to our coaches about player development, uh, specifically about guard development. Now, uh, uh, one of my mentors, um, Ed Gregory, who passed away a half a year ago, he told me, he said, Dirk, you can't be great without good guards. And he told me that 20 years ago. And in the modern, modern game of basketball, as we all know, um, guards are just key to anybody's success. Uh, the game has become so pick and roll heavy. Um, um, the, uh, the quality of your ball handler is crucial. Um, the pace, like I said, um, the amount of pick and rolls that teams run. If you don't have great decision makers, if you don't have great ball handlers, Uh, you're not going to be very good offensively. Um, so we felt that having Zach or asking to ask Zach about um, working with guards and developing their skills and their knowledge of the game and, and their approach to the game would be very, very um, 
helpful to the coaches and also because we invited our under 16 national team players to uh, to attend to uh, some of our best players that we have in the country in that age group. Uh, so again, uh, uh, long story short, um, I, I couldn't be happier uh, to have Zach do this. Uh, I'm super excited. Uh, I can't wait to hear what he's going to tell us, what he's going to talk about. So, uh, so Zach, thank you again uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, it's a privilege to have you on. I know that our coaches are super excited about uh, you doing this. And so uh, the floor is yours, my friend. Uh, danke für die Einladung. That's the last German I'll speak and I'll subject you to. Uh, but no, thank you, uh, first and foremost, to Dirk for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, he's a good friend. He's been a little bit of a mentor to me, um, helping me when I was a first time head coach in Summer League, the first time I ever did that. And I really leaned on him and his experience, uh, you know, obviously with the German national team and, and many other uh, along a long international journey that he's had. So I really appreciate him thinking of me and inviting me here to speak to you guys, it means a lot. Um, I, I really appreciate people taking time out of their busy schedule to, to grow the game. I think one of the things for me that has driven me as a coach is curiosity. And I think um, that's a very important skill for us all to have at any age, to continue to grow, continue to learn, and to be driven by our curiosities in life. And um, one of the things that I've been curious about for a long time is international basketball. So for as long as I've been uh, obsessed with basketball, I've been obsessed with international basketball. So I've been watching, you'll see in the presentation, it's not just NBA clips, it's a lot of international, national team, all kinds of things. So I have a passion for that. So I, I'm, I'm just equally as excited to you know talk to you guys and be able to share the game and really grow. And like Dirk said, I like to also say hello to the under 16 national team. I am very appreciative that you all are taking your time to learn and grow. Hopefully you can get something out of this. Hopefully we can all get something out of this about how to develop not only as basketball players, but as people. So thank you. Um, I didn't know, do you need to talk, uh, Helmut, something about uh, some technical things or are you good to go? Yeah, so um, uh, let me say a few rules. Uh, I'll, I'll do it in German uh, for everyone. Hallo zusammen, mein Name ist Helmut Wolf, ich bin der technische Host. Ich mache es ganz kurz. Einige Sachen dazu, viele haben schon Zoom-Sessions gemacht. Deshalb sind auch alle stumm geschaltet, das ist schon super. Ich würde alle bitten, im Namen von Peter Sadegast, sich mit dem realen Namen anzumelden, dass wir wissen, mit wem Peter es zu tun hat. Wir sind 100 Leute, über 100 Leute. Wäre auch schön, wenn ihr die Camps anhabt, so ein bisschen Interaktion. Und ähm, wenn es Fragen gibt vom Ablauf her, bitte in den Chat schreiben. Ihr habt unten eine Leiste, da könnt ihr draufklicken, da steht Chat. Äh, ihr könnt mich direkt anchatten, wenn es Fragen gibt. Wir werden die letzten 15 Minuten, 10, 15 Minuten äh, ein bisschen Q&A haben, also Question and Answer, Fragen und Antworten, dass wir das sammeln. Zack wird ungefähr 45 Minuten, 60 Minuten äh, seinen Vortrag halten, mit Video auch. Äh, und zum Abschluss ähm, möchte ich nur sagen, dass wir das alles aufzeichnen. Das zur Info. Und das war's für mich. Und um, I'll, I'll get back to you, Zack. Um, it's your session. Thanks a lot in advance. Great, thank you. And I'll start sharing my screen here. And we will start from the beginning. Okay, so just a quick background on me. Um, not going to talk long on this. This is just kind of my my pathway. Been working in uh, professional basketball since 2007, the NBA since 2010. I've been very fortunate to work for five really brilliant coaches and have learned uh, a ton and been a sponge to learn from all of them. You know, Quinn Snyder, Greg Popovich, Jacques Vaughn. Quinn Snyder again in Utah, Rick Carlisle in Dallas, and then now Wes Unsell Jr. in Washington, where I'm currently an assistant coach. So very fortunate, very lucky um, in my background to learn a lot from a lot of really smart people. Okay, so, but the real reason we're here 
is to talk about player development, right? Dirk did a good job kind of setting the table, helping understand what, um, what we're looking at. Um, the first thing I would say is um, the holistic view of player development. You can see there at the top on the title slide. And what I mean by that is we have to look at player development as a whole, right? As how all the little interconnected parts connect to the whole being, right? It's not just about, I think we have a tendency to look at like, oh, here's this new skill or this new move or this new drill that I want to work on, right? We, we all kind of gravitate to that, but we have to understand it's everything, right? Player development is all that goes into developing a person, a human being at the end of the day. And we have to remember also that this is, this is not an individual sport. This is not tennis, right? This is not golf. We are developing players to fit into a team structure. And I think one of the biggest things that we do in the United States that we could be better at is that we do too many of these boutique one-on-one -on -one individual workouts. And it's like the, the game is not played in a vacuum, right? We play a five-on-five -five dynamic game that's fluid and going back and forth. And we want to try to isolate these individual things. So I think our biggest thing is like to understand the whole Right. That's what we're trying to do. And to do that, you have to understand the physical, the mental, the emotional, the tactical. Right. They all tie in. So that's our goal is to try to I'm going to I'm going to show you today more of an overarching big picture theme of player development rather than drills or skills or things like that. So I would say the most important thing in player development from a coaching standpoint is this top bullet right here, and that's to connect. I think that's our job. There is no development without connection right i think that's our our biggest thing is you have to understand the person what makes them tick who they are what they're about what they value right and to do that you have to know their background their family their friends where they're from what their learning style is who their partners are they have children you know i know it's obviously different there's youth coaches there's different things and different levels that are, are taking part in this but i think it, it no matter what it matters you have to connect to these people and know them where they are and i think you develop that and i think it's easy to say like it, it there's no magic formula right there's no magic bullet a lot of times i call it sweat equity right so that's the amount of like just being on the court and working with these guys every single day right is what builds that connection what builds that sweat equity with everyone is just that daily commitment to a player. And also, I think you have to have a belief in a player. When I work with a player, I believe in them. I am wholeheartedly all in with this player to get better, right? I think you have to have that belief, right? You have to start with that connection and that belief. And those are key. The players feed off of that. They can feel this guy believes in me. He wants what's best for me and he can get me to where I need to go. So that's the connection element. And one, one example I'll give you. So obviously we're very privileged and lucky um, in the NBA to have, you know, the best resources and all of that. So I, I was paired with Joe Ingles. I worked with Joe individually, obviously was a great player at Barcelona at Maccabi Tel Aviv, you know, had an illustrious career over in Europe and then comes over to the, the NBA later in life. And, you know, there was one thing that really stood out to me that Quinn Snyder talked about is everyone can be developed at any age. Right. And and he paired me with Joe and we talked about, you know, developing his game and getting him even better um, while he's over here. And so one of the ways I connected with him is I went to Australia for three straight summers. I learned, you know, where he ate at, who his friends are, what his family's like, you know, and, and those moments are, are critical. Right. Is spending time with people off the court, breaking bread with them, eating with them, you know, getting to know them in a non basketball environment is, is really key, I think. All right, so that's the first piece is connection. Without connection, there is no development in my mind. And the next piece is proficiency, right? You've got to be proficient. You've got to be prepared. You've got to know what you're doing and know what you're talking about. And I think that a lot of that is just having a plan, right? It's doing the work. It's coming in before each day and having a plan and knowing how that plan for that day connects to the greater whole, right? So you just have to come prepared every single day to get these guys better, all right? And I think the, the thing too as coaches, right, is I think we have to remember one of our jobs is you are what you emphasize, right? That's one of my biggest phrases, you are what you emphasize. So what you do repeatedly day in, day out is what the results you will see. So if you choose to emphasize something, I think you will see that. And it's our job to be creative 
and find new ways, new and different ways to emphasize the same points over and over and over again. So I think that's where we talk about the proficiency is just these different ways of emphasizing the different points you're making and under, helping them understand how it, you know, how it connects. And that kind of transitions right into the next bullet point here. So you got to show them the why. You know, show them why I'm working on this. Why am I doing this footwork? Why am I doing this move? How does it connect to the game? Everything has to connect to the game and has to connect to making them better. And I think those are some of the biggest. I don't want to do something that doesn't happen in the game. I don't like I don't like using any extra technology. I only use one basketball. Like I just believe in make a game like as much as possible and connect it to the game. And I think that's our job is put it into a game context and create the environment. You know, we're almost like gardeners. We're creating the environment for the player to flourish. We're letting their skills shine, but we're just creating the environment day in, day out for these guys. And lastly, this word I have down here is curate, right? Kind of a funny thing. That's it's kind of how I look at player development, right? I look at it as a, we're an art curator, right? So our job as, as an art curator is to define and refine their game, right? Define. What are you? What do you do on the basketball court? What are the things that you do well? And one of my favorite things when I, I start working with a player is just to sit back. I sit back and watch. I watch their film from where they were previously. I like watching them playing. And a lot of times in August, you know, we'll have pickup games, open gyms, things like that. And the players will play. And players always show you. Players show you what they're good at, what their strengths are, what they gravitate to, what, they're, what they like to do. And it's our job to kind of watch from afar and curate and say, do more of this, mm, do less of this thing. And I think that's defining, defining who you are as a player based on what you're showing me and then refining that. Like, hey, let's do more of this, do less of this. Hey, if you added this, this could be good. So that's why I try to look at it as like an art curator, right? I'm just going to sit back and mold the different things and point you in different directions and edit your game a little bit, but you are doing the heavy lifting because the players are the, you know, I'm privileged to work with some of the most talented players in the world, right? I don't need to show them something new every day, right? I need to help define and refine their game. Okay, so next um, clip here. All right, we'll talk about on court work. Now, right now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to wow you with any of my drills, with any of that. We're not going to talk a lot about that. That's not really where my strength is. There are other people that are a lot better at that than me. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. But what I do is like I told you before, it's like a lot through film, a lot through connection, and a lot through emphasis. All right. But the things that we do need to do on the court is we need to be creative. We need to we need to emphasize certain things. And more importantly, we need to have players make decisions, right? Basketball is a game of decisions. It's not a game of rote over and over doing the same thing. So we need to overload them with the context of what we're doing and make decisions, All right? I was lucky enough. It was kind of a, you know, one of those light bulb moments I had. I was in Utah and um, we had Howell Netzel on our team. And I worked with Howell in Utah. Great guard, very talented. And he's from Brazil. And while he, when he played on his youth team, when he was like um, under under 16, you know, some of you guys that are on here's age, he played with an older player named Fernando Pereira, right? And his nickname was Nandez. And so Nandez, after playing, went and got an education and really got interested in neuroscience. And he was interested in how you connect neuroscience to basketball. And he came and worked with Howell and he had all these crazy, like, you know, props and things like this. And it was a little out there. But I was wowed by Nandez and how he did it. And he talked about overloading. He's like, he talked about overloading the player's brain because when you get in the game, then it'll be easier. So when we do decisions and we do overloading, we want to help them. And the other thing he talked about, sorry, uh, to backtrack, is your eyes. So the basis of my talk today, and you'll see in the next slide, is feet and eyes. When I talk about training guards, and even from just a base foundation level, that's what we do. Feet and eyes. That's what we want to train. So the the feet, right? Oh, we'll go back. We'll talk about that in a second. But so feet and eyes are the two biggest things, right? Now, I'm not going to give you a bunch of drills and how we do everything, but I will tell you, give you an example of what I'm talking about, about decisions and overloading. Okay, so let's say you're working on finishing. Let's say you're working on right hand, right foot finishing and pick and roll. So what we do to kind of give you a, a mental picture of it, we'd have the player talk about block practice some um, right hand right foot layup okay you understand it now now we're going to put a defender back there now we're going to put a live coach defending you one-on-one -on -one, and we're going to put another co coach 
in the opposite corner. Now, what's going to happen is as that def as that player is coming off the pick and roll, trying to get that right hand, right foot finish. If the coach on the weak side shows his hands, he has to deliver the pass. Okay. So just simple things like that, we're creating a decision, right? We're working on this micro skill, and then we're creating the decision that I have to make on that weak side. And then we might amp it up. We might add layers and layers to it. Now, if the coach holds up a number, I have to pass to him. If he says a color, I have to throw it back to another coach, right? And you can overload their brain and you can keep adding on the layers. And, you know, the ability for you guys to be creative and put your own spin on it is endless, right? I'm not going to give you a bunch of drills. Like I said, I'm just kind of talking about the big picture, but I want to give you some idea of what, you know, we're talking about here in terms of drills. All right, so we got decisions. We're trying to overload the brain and we're trying to teach the eyes what to look at and how to scan your environment. Okay. And then the last piece of, um, kind of the the framework I'll talk about with player development is video feedback. Now, I know, I don't know if you guys have the same resources and ability to tape, but we all have these, right? We all have phones, right? We have the ability to record. Anyone has the ability to provide video feedback, all right? So we have the ability to define and refine, and it's this one-on-one -on -one teaching time that I really think is important, right? So you have this time, it's a classroom setting for you to teach. And in the NBA, a lot of times with the amount of volume of games that we play, our true teaching is done through video, right? So you really feel comfortable in that medium of sitting down with a player at a computer screen and teaching them the game. So we use that one-on-one -on -one time. And I think you create a feedback loop, right? You play in the game, you watch film of it, all right? We see this skill we could work on. You know, we talk about defining and refining your game. Hey, do more of this, do less of that. The best example I'll give you is with Joe Ingles, right? On video feedback and defining and refining. So with Joe Ingles, watching him play, he would come off a pick and roll to his left hand, of course, very left hand dominant. And he one time he did a ball fake. He pat, pass faked and then finished. And I showed it to him. I was like, Joe, this is wonderful. I was like, you need to do this more. And he's like, ah, I don't know if I can get, you know, I can do it every time. I'm like, no, you need to do it once every other game, if not every game. Why not? Make them stop it. Because especially for Joe, Joe is such an unselfish player and a pass first player. We almost had to be more aggressive. We had to look shoot first to help loosen up his passing game. So we use that, but we leveraged the strength of his passing to make it um, more aggressive. So I told him, do that more. And guess what? We worked on it every day. We worked on it against coaches. We worked on that. Then we'd watch it on film and we'd talk about it. And the other one that we'd do with him was Joe one time in a game ball was thrown way high. He caught it, shot it right where it was, right? And we talked about that. We're like, whoa, catch high, shoot high. This is a very important skill off the ball, right? In the NBA, we have the best athletes in the world flying at you to close out. And this is a 6'9 Australian guy with a nice slow release, you know, like a catapult almost. So we had to find ways for him to get his shot off quickly. And so when he did that, I was like, this is something good, man. You need to do more of this. And we need to practice that every day and understand the different context in which it occurs. So then we create this feedback loop, right? So we have the video or we have the game that you play in. We watch it on video. We go rep it and practice, right? And then we play the game again. And then we get more feedback and we keep spinning around this loop and getting better and better and better. And that's player development, right? It's not a drill. It's just the connection with the player, the trust of the player that earned through that connection and that sweat equity and that time with him. And then the video feedback where you're showing proficiency and you're working on things. It's not about the drill. It's about the time, understanding the context of the player within the team, and then repping that and emphasizing that over and over and over again, right? That's what we want to do. So here's what I was talking about earlier, right? So feet and eyes, that's the base of your game, okay? So especially with guards, we want to talk about your feet and your eyes. It starts with your footwork, all right? It, it literally grounds you, right? Your feet are what's touching to the ground. And I think you look at Luka Doncic, right, who I was lucky enough to work with in uh, Dallas. Luka, how does he go by everybody, right? This is a 6'8", kind of pudgy, out of, you know, out of shape guy, but his ability to get by some of the best athletes in the world right? And you see it's his feet, all right? It's this deceleration. And I say there's three ways to go by someone, right? Change of speed, change of direction, and change in elevation, right? So going from high to low, low to high, right? Those three things are the best way. And that's all footwork, right? That's the basis of your game. 
And then you want to train the eyes to scan the floor, to see everything, to make the best possible decision, right? If we say it's a game of decisions, well, if you play, if you try to make a decision with little information, that's difficult, all right? And your eyes are the gateway to getting that information. So we train the eyes to scan the floor, to take in as much information as you can, so you can make the best possible decisions you can, all right? But you can't do it if you can't get there with your feet, and if you can't see what you need to do with your eyes. So that's what we're going to talk a lot about. OK, so we're going to watch a few clips um, video. Hopefully this is working well. If anything isn't working well and if you guys can't see it on your end, please speak up and let me know. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about footwork and some of the core principle footwork things that we talk about and that I'll teach with players. And the first thing is in kind of in flow, in transition, when you have an advantage, we talk about skipping. So watch Chris Paul right here with the ball. All right, so Chris Paul coming down the court. Now the video is skipping, but see how his knee is up in the air, right? So he's going to skip to set up his pick and roll, right? And that makes you a, a dynamic basketball player, right? That makes you an athletic stance. If you watch a sprinter at the starting block, he's got his feet staggered and he's low, all right? So we want to try to get to those positions as much as possible as basketball players. That's the best way to do it, all right? So he comes off this pick and roll, good setup, goes between his legs to change direction, misses the shot. All right. One of the things I want to talk about of this is we're showing pick and roll. We're showing the fun stuff first, right? The, you know, handling and pick and roll, doing these different things. But the thing we also have to remember is 90 to 95% of the time we're on the floor, we don't have the basketball. All right. So we got to know what are we doing with that 90 to 95% of the game? That's the key. All right. And the other thing we have to do is we have to divorce process from result. All right. So Chris Paul misses this shot, but I think his footwork is great. And I think that's a perfect teaching point. I don't care if he made it. And I know we're in a results-driven business, right? It's wins, losses, it's very binary, right? But we have to be the best teams, the best organizations, the best companies, the best whatever are process-driven. And we have to do as much as we can process-driven. And to me, that starts with, hey, that was a good feat, that was good eyes, and that was good decision, right? That's how we want to judge these different things is divorcing process from result. Okay, now watch James Harden right here. So he's up, straight up, and look at how low he gets. All right, you can see the line right there. His shoulder is at his hip. He looks exactly like a sprinter in the starting block, like we talked about. He's got this great staggered stance right here. Look at his hand. Like his hand is nearly touching the ground. All right, so he changed his elevation. He changed his speed, and he changed his direction. All right, those are three great ways to create separation and go by a defender, regardless of your athletic gifts right? You can go buy someone by doing these things, All right? So great job by James getting low, getting low to the ground, and now attacking and pick and roll and shooting a floater, okay? So good job by James there. Now watch Luca. So the other thing we can talk about, so skips in transition gets you in an athletic stance. If you watch Luka Doncic, watch him when the next time you watch an NBA game with Luka in it, Watch Luca before every single pick and roll. He skips into every single pick and roll because it gets him his rhythm, his timing, and it puts him in an athletic stance versus being flat footed, right? So watch him now. He has the pick and roll right before it's about to start. See that little skip? Watch that little hop right before he's about to go. Skip right there, all right? So he skips, and now he's at the advantage against Drew Holiday, one of the best defenders in the NBA, all right? he's able to reject the pick and roll. Because when we talk about pick and roll, the best way to attack a pick and roll is to reject it. Don't even go to the coverage, go away from all the coverage. That's our first look in pick and roll is rejecting it. And our rejecting is all about our setups and our setups are all about our feet. All right, so great job by Luca to skip, to set up, reject, and now he's downhill and able to finish at the rim. Okay, now here's a guy I work with. This is from this year, this is DeLon Wright. Like we work every day, together sometimes he rolls his eyes about skipping and doing some of these things he thinks it's kind of silly all right but we are we emphasize and if you emphasize something it shows up in the game so here's the lawn nice tire stance see the skip same thing just like luca skip reject all right he's able to get into the paint we see help we make the easy pass right in front of us great pass then the great shot for our team right these shots didn't go in but it's great process for us Okay, so that's kind of in flow, right? Being loose, being light on your toes, right? There's no ball pressure, right? That's, that's, the, that's the basis of that, okay, with the skip. 
now I talk about jab square. All right, so that's my terminology for this. So when we feel pressure, right? Joe Ingles does a great job here. He's got a closed stance, right? He's protecting the basketball. He's got a closed stance and he's dealing with this pressure right now. He's not exposing the ball to any kind of strip or steal. Now, as Rudy Gobert is coming up into this pick and roll, all right, he's sprinting up into it, doing a good job. Joe jabs and gets square, right? He's light on his toes like a boxer, all right? That's one thing we talk about, being light on your toes like a boxer. You got to be in an athletic stance at all times. Joe, all unathletic, you know, 6'8 of him is able to get separation about some of the best, some of the best players in the world, all right? So he creates this separation. Look at the gap between him and Devin Vassell now. And now he's able to come off this pick and roll, deliver an unbelievable pass, and we get a finish in the paint. Okay. Now here's Milos Teodosic. All right. One of my favorite guys in the world to watch. If I'm bored or I want to have a, put a smile on my face, I'll watch uh, Milos Teodosic pick and roll clips. All right. That's what I do for fun. It's wonderful. All right. So Teo has great patience, great poise, and great footwork. And that's what makes him great. Okay. So one of the things I'll, I will mention here is I want to tie the individual to the team. Right. And we got to understand that a pick and roll, is a five-man action, right? When we play pick and roll, that's a five-man action. It starts, Teo can't run this pick and roll if he doesn't have great spacing in the corners. This man lifted perfectly right here. This is great spacing. And then not only is it a five-man action, right? The marriage, the dance between the screener and the handler is everything, right? So that's when I talk about, when we talk about player development, when we do practice, you know, we'll do our individual, we call them daily vitamins. We do our 15 minute individual session with a player one-on-one. -on -one. But then a lot of times when practice starts, we do another development session, right? We use the first 10 minutes of practice and it might be positional. So all the point guards might be together and it might be in combination. So we'll bring the, uh, the point guards together with the bigs. And we'll talk about timing and setups, screening angles, and all these things. So that's a, a big thing for us is the, the marriage of this is that it's basketball is interconnected. We can't be in these silos by ourselves and just worrying about development individually, right? We have to develop collectively together as a team. And you only do that through reps together. So I know guys want their shots. They want to have, you know, comfort and all that stuff. And that's important. But basketball is about connection and the connection between teammates. So great job sprinting up into the screen by the screener and phenomenal um screening angle look at him like right here good wide base captures this defender's feet inside of his feet that's a nice little teaching point when teaching a screener um and i think that's uh, uh the other key is we teach guards big skills we teach bigs guard skills right everyone gets the same development right i work out with chris ops for Zingas, and i teach him almost like a guard on things and we teach our guards how to set pick and rolls as you'll see later um in the rest of the talk but right here, teaching point, capture his feet inside of your feet. Great screen right here. We get downhill, spaced well, get a corner kick out. Great shot for the team, right? And it's all based on that. The footwork kind of ties everything together. You got to be able to get to where you need to get on the court. And without that, there's nothing, all right? And the next one, either as a setup or later on in the pick and roll, is right hand, left foot jab. All right, so we've all done the, you know, pivoting and jabbing, you know, out of a triple threat position, right? Think of the same thing, but with an active dribble, right? I keep the ball in my right hand and I jab with my left foot. And now I keep the defender off balance with just my chest and shoulders staying forward, right? So I have my chest and shoulders forward. I have the ball in my right hand and I jab with my left foot and go right, right? Simple. We don't expose the ball in a crossover, but it, the ability to shift the defense and shift defenders, as you'll see, is huge. So right now, Denny Avdia handling for the Israeli national team. All right. Does a good job. Just that, right. He pairs with a little bit of an in and out dribble, but see right hand, left foot jab. All right. One more time, right hand, left foot jab, creates space, gets by the defender and you're downhill. These simple little footwork and um, combinations can really go a long way. So right here, all right, Luka Doncic, with the national team, it's kind of hidden right here in the clip, but you see he's got the ball in his left hand and a right foot jab, right? Left hand, right foot jab. And look at this. He 360s a defender around off just a subtle, simple little jab, right? That's what it takes is just we take these little pieces of footwork, 
you pair it with change of speed, change of direction, change in elevation, and you can create big results. You don't need all these crazy dribble combinations, two hands, a tennis ball, all this stuff. You need simple footwork, and you need to marry that with understanding the game concept, context of when to use it, right? So this is a pick and roll. We're attacking, and boom, we jab right there. We create the space and draws a foul. Great. All right, so that's that's kind of at the beginning of the pick and roll, a setup or rejecting away from it, all those types of things. Now watch Josh Giddy here. All right, this is a great job of Josh in a drop. So one of the times we talk, we talk about using this jab to jab the gap. All right, so when there's a drop coverage, the big is down the floor. Rudy Gobert, one of the best in the world, being down the floor, playing this kind of two-on-two -two cat and mouse game in pick and roll. Right, he's back down the floor. We want to jab the gap. We want to make him think, I'm going this way. I'm going to the middle of the floor. So watch Josh Giddy. We'll play it in fast mode. We'll play it in normal speed, and then we'll come back and we'll uh, we'll watch it in slow motion. So he jabs the gap and he gets by him. Right. So one more time, he comes off. He uses that left foot and he uses a little in and out dribble to pair with it. But really, you can just keep the ball without even that. And watch what it does to Rudy's hips. Right. It shifts his hips gets him off balance, and allows to create this separation and this advantage to get by. And now the next thing he does is this, all right? So the thing I talk about with finishing is finishing is almost ball handling to me, just like off the dribble shooting is ball handling. It's how quickly you can get the ball from here to where it needs to go, right? And off the dribble shooting, it's how quickly can you get it from your move to your shot pocket to be able to shoot. In finishing, right there, what you're seeing Josh do is Josh's ability to get the ball from the dribble to full extension away from the shot blocker. So that's the key, right? Shot blockers, when they block shots, they block shots based on timing, right? They wanna come down, they wanna time up your steps, you know, classic right, left, finish, right? They're blocking that. Rudy Gobert, he's putting that into the third row, okay? But what Josh Giddy does here, he creates him a little off balance with the in and out and the left foot, right hand, left foot jab. And then he goes from dribble to full extension. Right. And that's the key is how quickly you can get from here to arm fully extended to get it onto the backboard as quickly as possible. And now a subtle nuanced technique thing that I talk about. I don't know if you guys know as much about uh, you have pinball machines. You know, you know, the little things, the pinball machines. So they have these flippers. Right. So the way I talk about finishing and then with your right hand, when you're doing these extension finishes is you want to have a flipper. Right. You want to use your hands like a flipper and just flip it up, because if you turn your thumb you turn your thumb over like you would on some finishes, you're going to have problems creating too much rotation on it. So we talk about a flipper and just having that and flipping that thing up and getting it softly on the rim. And you can kind of see, I know that it's a little grainy, it's a little hard to see, but see how his palm stays open? See how he doesn't turn his thumb right there, right? His palm stays open, great technique, allows that ball to go in, right? You turn your thumb, you create too much spin, allows that thing, you know, a lot more ways for it to go wrong. All right, so here's DeLon Wright, same thing, setting up his pick and roll. What's he doing again? He's skipping into it, right? We do the same things over and over, and we're great at them. There's no magic. Magic's in the work. All right, good job keeping his dribble alive. He jabs the gap right there against Dwight Powell. See how he opens his hips, and we create this easy downhill drive. He could finish that. He chooses not to. Good respace by Denny Avdia. We draw a foul. We're in the bonus, and we get free throws. Okay? The next piece of footwork we'll talk about is back foot spin. Great clip for you guys here. German national team doing very well. Love it. Up on Greece. Phenomenal job. Great ball pressure. We know Dennis Schroeder, one of the best ball hawks in the NBA. You know, great pressure, very difficult. All right, so smart job right here by Nick Calathis. He turns his back to him, right? He's got that closed stance again, like we talked about with Ingles, right? When we did the jab square. We want that closed stance. That's how we deal with ball pressure, right? When you're getting picked up full court as a guard, you can do a couple things, right? You can beat them with speed or you can turn your back to them. And I call it kind of like Pablo Prigioni your way up the floor, all right? Turn your back to them, create space, don't expose the ball. All right, those are a couple simple ways for guards to bring the ball up the court, all right? But great job by Calathis. He's protecting the ball and you see his right foot forward. Before when we did the jabs, square he bounced off off this right foot i want you to pay attention to this left foot his back foot right watch him spin up on that toe right so we want to get up on the toe that's the teaching point that we want to get up on that toe and spin on that foot and see this 
separation he created, he knew exactly where, once again, being married in connection. Giannis is right there. He knows I need to get this dude to run into this screen and go over. So how am I going to do this? And one of the things we talk about, there's two different ways to do it. You see a lot of screen to ball where the screener comes to the ball. One of the things, especially with guys who you see unders on, we want to take the ball to the screen. So the screener is static. He stays stationary. And the ball handler brings the ball to the screen. So great example of that right here by Kalathis, right? He has great footwork to set up the pick and roll and takes him right into Giannis's stationary screen. All right. Luckily, the German national team, very well coached, very disciplined, industrious country. You guys play great defense, get a steal. Giannis turns the ball over. Everyone's very excited. A lot of great enthusiasm from the team, you know, playing defense as one collective country, you know, well coached group. Well, well, well coached group. All right. So here we talk about, I just, this was from two days ago. I had my presentation all done and I got so excited. I was watching a game on ESPN. I saw Tyrese Maxey do it. Right. So you want to have the other thing we talk a lot about, right. With our team and with players is having solutions to different coverages, right? I just talked about ball to screen as a good job versus under. Well, one of the things you see is weak, right? Teams sending players to their weak hand, getting up, forcing them to that left hand, right? So here's a great counter, the back foot spin. One of the perfect things it does is it's a solution, right? To weaking pick and roll coverage. So right here, Howell Neto is going to weak Tyrese Maxey to his left hand. Joel Embiid and a quarter pick and roll, right? He's coming up into this pick and roll and they weak it. All right, and this is talk, talking about getting connected. Like two things we talk about, right, is Tyrese Maxey can back this ball up. Once he feels this weak, he can back the ball up. And now Joel Embiid can turn the angle to set this step up screen and release Howell downhill or release Maxey downhill, right? He can get downhill to his left where he can snake or cut back to his strong preferred right hand. All right, but right now he does neither of those things. He just accepts the weak. All right, and this is one of the times we love this, right? If you accept the weak, is see Maxi's back foot, once again, just like Calathis. He's high on that toe. He's up on that toe. Once again, what do we talk about? Light like a boxer, right? Staying up on your toes, being in athletic stances, all right? He's up on his toe, and Embiid stays there, all right? And once again, we get ball to screen. Now, I think Embiid really just wants to shoot, to be honest, but we'll just say he's being a really good team player and trying to set this screen for Tyrese Maxi. all right? So now he sets another one of these area screens. We're bringing the ball to the screen to fight the weak right here. So great job by Tyrese Maxey, taking him to the screen, getting downhill. Now, this is a point we talk a lot about with finishing, right? So right now he takes off too high, right? He's taking off, you know, damn near at the free throw line. All right, one more dribble, but I know, uh, you know, what we'll say is, you know, Donovan Mitchell up the line right here in good position makes him pick up his dribble. But if you can get one more dribble and not launch yourself, because those are tough finishes, right? So we want to get closer. We'll talk more about how we how we counter that thing right now. Okay, this is a stoplight. I know you guys, uh, you know, at the Autobahn, you kind of have no rules. You drive whatever you want. I know you have some some stoplights, you know, other places. But so this is the metaphor we use for our guys. And that's that's one thing I'll talk about is just there's power in storytelling, in humor, in making things funny, keeping things light and using visual representations for guys to latch on to in their memory. And that's the you know, that's the gene. That's the the interesting thing about coaching is finding new ways to connect these stories and information to guys and get them to stick in their brain. And one way we talked about is a stoplight. Okay. And how it, how it relates in this context in pick and roll is we're going to talk about the court right here. Okay. So we see this court right here. And um, so we have green right here. So we know as soon as you cross half court, that's green. Green means go, right? Just like in the stoplight, just like, in traffic, green means go. That means you can attack. You can attack downhill and get to where you need to go. Use your footwork, use your setups, but we are in green right here. And then once you get inside the three-point line, somewhere between the top of the key and the free throw line, that's when you need to slow down, all right? And that's when our eyes come in, right? As we get into that yellow, our eyes are scanning the weak side, right? We should be able to handle our defender in pick and roll and the guy guarding me. But now I'm scanning the weak side and I'm helping to understand in these situations, in these yellow zones, I got to slow down, boom, slow down, use my change of speed, use my change of direction, use my change in elevation. All right. That's what I got to do in the yellow. All right. I keep my dribble alive. And then if I get into the paint, all right, that's red. Stop. Right. We got to stop. We can't just keep going. That is a stop. 
All right, when we get there, we got to use feet and fakes, right? It all comes back to your feet, right? Your feet and your eyes. You get in the paint, you got to come to a jump stop, preferably use a pivot, all right, and find the open man. And then you can use fakes. I think one of the most underused things in basketball are ball fakes, right? Ball fake is one of the most important things. I've seen guys who cannot shoot. Sam Young was a famous example, right? Played at Pitt, played in the NBA for Memphis, couldn't shoot a lick, had one of the best pump fakes in the game. He would get guys going for it all the time. All right, we had, I coached Nikola Vucevic in Orlando. And we played this guy named Al Jefferson. He was an old school, low post, back to the basket player. Had a phenomenal pump fake. He would do a one-hand pump fake on a jump hook, right? So we're playing against him. We'd shown the personnel film. We talked about it. All we talked about is his pump fake, his pump fake, his pump fake. He goes out there, first play, left block, gets to the middle, or yeah, left block, gets middle, left shoulder, shot fake, does his, you know, pump fake. Sure enough, Nikola Vucevic goes for it, fouls him, comes out of the game. We sub him out because we told you we would sub you out if you went for it. And we're like, Vooch, like, what's going on, man? How'd you go for it? He goes, what? It looks so much like his shot, right? So the importance of fakes, like even the best in the world fall for these fakes, right? So we can not only fake shots, but you can ball fake, right? We have to fake a pass to make a pass a lot of times, especially when you're dealing with aggressive pick and roll coverages, right? You get a blitz or maybe a show sometimes, right? You got to fake a pass to make a pass. So that's big things. And so same thing applies when we get into the paint, all right? We got to get off two feet and we got to be able to make a pass. But also red could mean stop because I can shoot, right? So if you have the advantage, you got to shoot and take that advantage. So that's what we talk about is like, we're going to use this metaphor of the stoplight. So green, yellow, slow, go, slow, stop, make a decision, use your feet and fakes. Okay. So let's take a look at some clips. So once again, Denny with the national team, pretty good pick and roll setup comes off and look at that, right? It's subtle, right? So he goes green. Once he gets into that yellow zone, see how he slows down, just kind of chops his feet a little bit slows down his pace and look at Laurie Markkinen, right? He relaxes, he relaxes and that gives the ability for Denny to go by. Here's some examples of feet and fakes. And I'll also show you one where right now, I don't think Howell does a good job. Howell's a very good pick and roll player, but here everyone has opportunities where they can get better. And right now, Howell comes off his hand up, pretty good flip right there from KP or right away, you see a DHO, we're trained, All right? Great footwork from KP to twist that angle, pivots on that inside foot, forces a chase over from Haul. All right, now, as Haul gets downhill, see how I'll play it one time in fast motion. Sorry, I'm a perpetual pauser and slow motion guy, so I apologize in advance. I'm always pausing and slow motioning. So right now, we'll play it at full speed, and then I'll wind it back. So right now, Haul comes off and watch. He plays at one speed this whole time, takes off, flies, jumps in the air to make a decision, right? I think jump passes are very important, but we jump pass after we know what we're doing, all right? So Haul basically gets caught, you know, trying to drive through here, driving into three bodies and a fourth with RJ Barrett down there kind of lurking, all right? So we get kind of lucky that he passes this, all right? So one thing we talk about too, when you're a perimeter player, all right, when you're working off the ball, all right, we talk a lot about read before the catch. You want to read before the catch. So you're making a decision as you're receiving the basketball. So we talk about go and catch, not catch and go, not drive a closeout. It's go and catch. So you're going. Now, this is a terrible pass, but we want him moving before on the flight of the pass, kind of running through the basketball, go and catch to create these advantages. All right, but right now, so we talked about the green, the yellow, and the red. So we got green, right? He's got an attack mode right now. He's green. Now he gets right to this kind of free throw, and he goes yellow, slows it down. All right, and now Corey Kisper does a great job. He's in the paint, and he's got feet and fakes, right? See him fake, just that little shot fake, pivot, and now he's able to see the open man. If he stays at one speed and tries to force a shot up, he's probably shooting a really difficult contested left-hand shot against RJ Barrett and they're rebounding and they're running the other way. All right. But instead, Corey has good patience. He comes to a pivot and that ability to slow down allows his eyes to see the open man. All right. And there's KP prefer KP attack to close out better, but it's the NBA people catch and hold. It happens. We prefer him to keep flowing and playing, but good job here. Once again, KP gets into the paint. He gets feet and fakes. 
and he gets a guy in the air and gets a great finish. And that's a that's an important thing. Like, you know, we talked a little about it. So I work with KP. And one thing we've been talking about all year, all right, is drawing fouls, right? Because the most valuable shot in basketball, it's not a corner three, it's not the rim, it's a free throw, right? The free throw is the most valuable shot in basketball. So if he can use fakes to draw fouls, because people are so worried about him and his ability to rise up and shoot at seven foot three, he's called the unicorn for a reason. This is a really unique basketball player, right? That can shoot over top of any type of closeout and make any type of shot. But what really will take him to the next level is the ability to draw fouls and get easy baskets for his team. So we've talked last year, this year, nonstop about drawing fouls. And to do that, it's this. It's this simple feet and fakes pivot game. You know, it seems simplistic. It seems this. But I'll tell you, it the amount of dividends it pays for you is so much more valuable than not doing it, right? You have to find these feet and fakes in the paint. Okay, you got to stop. I think this is something you guys know. I don't know. I Googled it. We got to stop in the paint. All right, so here, here's an example. All right, how will Neto gets redemption after his last, you know, pick and roll didn't have the best one. All right, gets a closeout. All right, pretty good closeout by Tomas Sadoransky. All right, Sato sits down, guards him. But look at this, just that little hesitation. Once again, footwork, right? Keeps his dribble alive, little back foot spin, creates the advantage, and now he gets in the paint, feet and fakes. Right. If he just he could easily shoot a floater, shoot a one legged shot and no one would blink an eye. But instead, he pivots, he fakes and he kicks the ball out and we get a wide open three for our team. And we love that. That's great process for our team. All right. That's really great process. And now we'll bring it back to the pick and roll again with the lawn. Right. OK, so here's the lawn. Nice little double drag set coming off and watch his speed. Change of speed. Slow. Keeps his dribble again. Slow. Change of speed, change of direction, gets a drop-off pass, feet and fakes in the paint, right? So one more time, all the way through, full speed. He's going to get, he's going to attack, keep his dribble alive, keep his dribble alive, and get a great drop-off pass right there, feet and fakes, right? So we got to change our speed. We got to slow down, all right? That's one of the biggest keys for us, okay, is we got to change our speed, change our direction, keep our dribble alive. That's the kind of stoplight metaphor. Okay, now we'll give you a different visual, right? The NBA is crazy. We have all these different camera views, angles we can get. I was able to pull these clips of some of the best pick and roll ball handlers in the NBA to show you about eyes, right? So we talked about feet and eyes, feet and eyes. We've shown you a lot of the different footworks, a lot of the different contexts when you can use those foot, uh, footwork. And now here's the eyes. So watch Tyrese Halliburton on this pick and roll. Once again, good pace, good skip into pick and roll. And now look, right? You can see his eyes right there. Look at him looking. He's reading JT Thor right here in the paint. He's making his decision. He's looking through Plumlee. He's not worried about Plumlee and Terry Rozier who are guarding. He's worried about Thor and this other weak side defender, right? That's what takes next level pick and roll plays. Can you get your eyes onto the third defender? All right. And another good hesitation and he misses the layup. Now I like doing, um, kind of like the Socratic method. Like one of the things I like coaching with players and with people. Um, so if one of you could chime in, cause I can't see the screen. What would you say is one thing that he does wrong on this finish? Does anyone see anything what he does wrong on this finish that I talked about earlier when we talked about those scoop finishes with the flippers? What does he do wrong on this? Can anyone chime in? You can say it out loud. You can unmute and say it if you can, if you know. It's too much a spin of the thumb, no? Maybe? Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, right, he turns his thumb. That's why we talked about. We need these flips because right now he has a lot of spin on his thumb. Great hesitation, great process. But now the spin creates a little too much torque on the ball right there. All right, Chris Paul, one of the best ever. Great answer. Sorry, I didn't see you said that, but thank you. Great answer. Right now, Chris Paul. All right, watch. See how quickly he gets his eyes around, right? So they're running stack. Spain pick and roll, as some people call it. You know, we're back screening um, the big in the in the pick and roll. Right now, Devin Booker had slipped out of the stack early. Okay. So the way the Sacramento Kings play defense, they're in aggressive as their low man, right? That low man is in Keegan Murray right here. He's the third defender. There's obviously a strong side defender. So bonus is up at the level pressuring and pick and roll. Because of Chris Paul's setup, once again, look at him change speed. Comes down the floor, subtle hesitation, subtle footwork. Now he's going full speed. He's in green, right? He's going, but he's got his eyes and he sees, you can't see him now, but Kevin Herter is standing right at the charge circle, right in the middle of the paint. 
All right, so Chris Paul sees it, and now he knows, all right, now I just got to manipulate him. I got to get DeAndre Ayton rolling a little bit, keep that guy glued in, and I'm going to deliver that pass. And what the greats do is he sees his eyes, now he looks him off. All right, now he's not even looking at the pass he makes because he knew I got the look I wanted. And Kevin Herter still in, delivers the pass out, and we get a corner three. All right, that's high level, but it starts with his eyes. You can't do it if you don't have your eyes around. So let's watch DeLon Wright right here. So same thing, kind of poor execution on a horn's twist. But right now, see how quickly he gets his eyes around? And he's reading Will Barton, who's down here, this head that's kind of in no man's land down here. Okay, so we got this drop coverage. And a big thing, too, we talk about connection. I want these guys to be in the same path, in the same plane, on the same line, right? That helps you. If he's too far behind you, you have to wait too long, and that allows the defender to get back in front. So we talk about being in the same line, the ball handler and the pick and roll player. If the pick and roll player can get in front of him, even better. But because we can throw this lob, we can have vertical spacing as well as horizontal spacing with a lob threat like Daniel Gafford. All right, we can really stretch the floor. So he can throw this lob earlier as long as they're on the same plane. All right, so they're in the same line right now. Preferred DeLon to be a little further out, but, you know, life's not perfect. All right, so good job. Good job right here by Will Barton, right? He was in. He faked. He acted like he was going to take the roll. So DeLon was about to pass it out. He sees him go out and take that away. All right, so now he doesn't have anything. All right, perfect role to keep our dribble. But here he picks it up, and now he fakes, right? Just a little subtle fake. It's not even anything, right? It's very little. Boom, just a little fake. Gets Gary Trent in the air, right? Even that, not even a good fake. Small fake, feet and fakes, allows him to open the floor. And it creates this open pass, you know, to Corey Kispert right here. All right, so now Corey's got the ball, and Corey's attacking a closeout. And I love this, right? So green, shoot, pass, drive decision. He goes shot fake. And now as he drives, look at him get his eyes around, right? He sees Thad Young. He sees early Thaddeus Young is there to help. I don't have a straight line drive to the rim. What's open now? Look at him get his eyes around, manipulate the ball, deliver a beautiful left-hand pass out to Kendrick Nunn for a three, right? That's beautiful basketball, right? Off the ball, space, re-space, making the right decision, and it all starts with their eyes. You can't make a decision if you can't see it. So we got to train the eyes to look out. Right here, Luka Doncic, same thing. Off the cutback, see how he gets his eyes around very quickly right there. All right, he gets his eyes around quickly. He's able to see, get in the paint, manipulate the defense, drop off the pass. All right, great job right there um, by Luka. I'm going to show you two more eyes clips, and then we'll move on to a couple conceptual things. All right, same thing. Luka gets his eyes out early. All right, what we talked about, right, we want Christian Wood on the same plane, so he's a little behind. All right, this is a pretty standard thing, right? Going away from the two-man side, this is what you see. You see a low man. You see a guy as the X-out defender, right? This guy, Chris Paul, is taking the first pass, whether it be to Reggie Bullock up top or whoever is in this corner. All right, Luca does a great job, green attacking, and now he's getting to this yellow zone, and he knows I got to hold to get that defender to make these two guys make a decision. All right, so he's attacking, holding his dribble, seeing what he can get, there's the roll going down. And then once again, a subtle little fake from Luca, buying more time, throws to the guy pulling behind. And now we get something easy. We get a, a trigger to attack a closeout. All right, and we get attack a closeout and right on the rim. All right, good, simple basketball, but it started with his eyes and manipulating the defense. Last one for the eyes. You can see Joe Ingles right here. Mo Wagner, tremendous pick and roll player, but in this time he gets bested. All right, great job by Joe. Picture's kind of blurry, but you can see it early. He's getting his eyes around, seeing. And right now, see that ball fake? That manipulated this guy right here, Paolo Bancaro. And now that allows him to deliver this pass to Brooke Lopez under the rim. And now we'll see it from the other angle so you can really see the beauty of it, how he's eyeing Bancaro this entire time. He's not worried about the two guys in the pick and roll. He's worried about manipulating this weak side defender because Joe really wants to throw the ball to the big. All right, so great job. He sees this defender right there. And then with his eyes, he's able to manipulate the defense, ball fake, deliver a pass to Brooke Lopez. Okay, so that was kind of my initial spiel on player development and understanding the holistic part, and especially on the feet and the eyes and the use of fakes, the use of changing speed, changing direction. 
All right, the next part I'll talk about that I, it's something I really believe in and I want to talk to you a little bit kind of conceptually about it and it's advantage basketball. I think this is the best way to play basketball. I think this is the, play, the way that everyone wants to play basketball. People are more likely to defend. They're more likely to be engaged in the game if they're involved in the game, right? We have to move the basketball. Everyone has to be involved. But how we do it is we want to trigger an advantage, all right? We want to play with an advantage. And once we get that advantage, we got to keep it and then we got to use it, right? So we get it by a trigger, by a pick and roll, by a post up, by a pin down, by a handoff, right? Those are all triggers. That's how we get an advantage, all right? To keep it, we have to have great spacing, right? And spacing is alive. Spacing lives and breathes throughout a possession, right? It can't ever stay static. Right. As the ball goes away, you have to pull behind. When the ball comes at you, you got to move away. Right. If you drive and make a pass, you got to re space out. Right. So through a possession, it's living and breathing. So that's how we have to keep an advantage is through spacing and reading closeouts and making the right reads and passes with our eyes. And then finally, we got to use it. We got to get a shot. Right. That's the ultimate goal. We got to get a good shot. And the NBA, we're obsessed with getting to the rim. We love the rim and we like threes, right? But you have to put pressure on the rim, make the defense collapse, and now we can get these kick out threes, okay? But the next thing is, guess what? The defense, they get paid too, right? So they're going to stop you sometimes. We're going to trigger an advantage. We're going to try to keep it. Boom, they have great defense. They stop it. When we're neutral, when we have no advantage. We got to find action to trigger another advantage, okay? So let's look right here. The next thing I want to talk about is ball movement, right? And it's a Pep Guardiola line, all right? He did a good job with Bayern. Pep Guardiola talks, we move the ball to move the defense. We don't move the ball for the sake of moving the ball. We want to shift the defense from strong side to weak side, weak side to strong side. And then there's this, there's power in a swing pass, right? There's power in just simply moving the ball to the other side. And we'll talk a little bit more of that later. But right now, I want to talk about kind of finding action and advantage basketball. So right now we play a double drag, all right? Now kind of bad spacing, Corey Kisper is trying to get out to this corner and balance the floor. Monte Moore should be here. It's not perfect, basketball is never perfect. All right, right now, Brad swings it. And right now we're neutral, right? They're switching one through five, so we have no advantage. So right now, Brad's got to think, I got to create action, right? Even one of the best players in the world, Brad Beal, all right? He's going to act as a screener because we can get good stuff out of this. All right, so right now, one thing I think with Brad is, especially these guys, is you can sprint and slip in and slip or go in and then slip, sprint and slip out, okay? So that's a great advantage for a guy that can shoot, even non-shooters, is sprinting and slipping out, all right? A little tough from this kind of lateral side to side angle. So one thing we talk about is when you're above, we want you to plant that left foot, this foot right here, into the ground and cut through that space. All right, so Brad doesn't do a great job. He tries to kind of hold a screen, doesn't get anything. Okay, that happens. They switch another screen. All right, we are neutral again. We have nothing. Ball goes to Denny. All right, Denny has it right here. And Corey Kispert, a wing, a guy that was driving closeout, shooting threes, now comes into this pick and roll. Now, can anyone, once again, going back to the you know, Socratic method, can anyone tell me what's great about Corey Kispert's screen right here? Uh, he got the feet, no, in between yes. feet, maybe. Exactly. He captured Spencer Dinwiddie's feet in his feet. All right. And the other thing we talk about when you're seeing a switching defense is we're going to tap his back shoulder and get below, or his back hip, I'm sorry, his back hip pocket and get below. So right now he just touches and goes. All right. We don't now they it's a little, you know, it's the NBA. We can get away with some shit, right? We don't want him to really fully extend and push. We just want tap and release to get the ball okay so great angle capturing spencer's feet and he taps out and gets below okay and then a great pass right there from denny and a great finish by Corey. all right but that's how we want to play we want to find action we don't want to stay static and have iso or bad possessions everyone was involved all five players set a screen received a screen handled the ball spaced respaced in that possession that's beautiful basketball okay right here same thing. We kind of run this backside flip action. We turn this screen so Kawhi Leonard is not able to switch out. We kind of flip the angle. All right, now we're into this three-man dribble handoff. Well, guess what? The Clippers, they're really good. They, they sniffed it out. They do a kind of triple switch, and they fix it. All right, now we're neutral. 
All right, so great job by Denny. Instead of coming from like an elevated position, now he could sprint and slip out. And one of the things, so I'll give you something that Duncan Robinson from the Miami Heat, one of the best three-point shooters in the NBA, he has a little subtle trick. As he sprints and slips out, he learns what the opponents call a switch. You know, most people will call it either switch or a lot of times in the NBA, we use colors, right? Black or red. And he'll know what you call a switch. And as he sprints up, he'll tap your hip and he'll yell, or maybe he'll even yell early, black, 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 and he'll sprint out and slip out, right? It's these little subtle dark arts that you can do to create action and do things. So you can sprint and slip, or you can roll below, All right? So Denny rolls below, doesn't throw to him, but watch right now. This is, so we talked about, if you're below, roll, touch, and get out. If you're above, find action. Great job right here by Kuz. Watch him plant that outside foot, boom, right foot into the ground, and just slip right through that gap, all right? And the other key, Respace, respace, and Denny needs to get back out to space. All right. Kyle slips out and gets a layup. Okay. Last one. Talk about two things. All right. That people talk about what to do with non shooters. Right. So Draymond Green, non shooter. All right. I still want to space them. We want to space. Everyone's spaced around the perimeter because space is king. Space is the most important thing. So great sprint and slip right here from Clay Thompson creates an advantage. He triggered an advantage. He keeps the advantage with his closeout, right? Reads the closeout, drives the gap. All right, now non-shooter, right? They're going to help off of him, right? We have two options, right? And we call it a ball mover, right? When you're spaced in the perimeter and you don't want to shoot it, you can ball move right away. Move the ball right to another player. Now we know this is Steph Curry, right? Unbelievable shooter, unbelievable range. He tees up a three, but think of it just as easily as a pick and roll rolling below. Curry can attack you know, Dwight Powell in a pick and roll coverage, get downhill and we can find whatever we want. All right. But the other thing we can do, we call follow his footsteps. Okay. So now here we're spaced. Watch Daniel Gafford in this corner. Same thing, very similar to the Draymond situation. All right. He's doing this, which we talk about. We want to space. We don't want to creep in. All right. Denny Obdi has an ability to creep in. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this term in English and kind of like slang, you know, if you're kind of a weird guy and you know, doing some not nice things. You're a creeper, right? You're creepy. So we don't want to creep into this space. And Daniel Gafford's being a creeper right now. We don't want to be a creeper. Don't creep. Stay spaced. Okay. So right now, perfect world, he'd be spaced. But when we see help, you can follow his footsteps. So wherever he goes, you follow his footsteps and you're right on the rim. Okay. One thing talking about spacing, understanding, eyes is a kill cut. All right, so we want to kill your rotation. So normal, like trap the box, shell defense, right? Emmanuel quickly is going to come over, trap the box, Quentin Grimes, he's going to drop below. He's going to protect um, on this pass to Denny. Well, we want to kill their rotation. So the guy we're really messing with is Brunson right here. This guy's never on time, right? When you do shell drill, he's there sometimes. In a game, he's never there on time, all right? So he's supposed to fill in here and protect on this cut from Corey. But right now, we want a kill cut. So that's about vision, anticipation. Corey got to know what he's looking at, seeing it. On this baseline drive, we want a kill cut, right? That's just a simple spacing thing that I wanted to give you guys that I really like and I think is simple, good basketball. Okay, one thing I want to – last two clips I want to talk about. We'll start with Draymond Green right here. I was actually telling the guys yesterday, the power of a swing pass, not – I catch it, I survey, I need to do this. The power of simply catching the ball, swinging it the other way, or catching it in a simple dribble handoff the other way. In your mind, it may look, it may look like nothing's coming out of that because you didn't score right off that immediate action. But what it did was it made the defense change size of the floor. Because as you know, every defense in the NBA is good if you play one side of the floor. It's, when, it's once you start switching sides of the floor and now all of a sudden the low man is now the strong side corner man and he gets lost and the low man who was over there strong side corner forgets to pull in and he's lost. That's when you can really dissect a, a defense and pick them apart. I kicks it out. Okay, so I thought the most important thing that Draymond talked about there was strong side becomes weak side, weak side becomes strong side. So right now I want you to watch Jay Crowder. And just the simplicity of moving the ball, not to get an assist, not to do anything, but other than just simply playing unselfish basketball. All right. So right now, game one, NBA finals, right? First quarter, right? They're as locked in as they can be, right? They're going to play intense defense. Jimmy Butler, 
doesn't have anything on the pick and roll. Good spacing thing, right? So if he kept driving baseline, Goran Dragic, he should kill cut, right? That's what we talk about. This middle guy, kill their rotation. But the other thing we have to do is anytime the ball moves away from you, you got to pull behind. So great job pulling behind right here by Jay, providing an outlet. Now, Jay could easily get in his bag, go one-on-one, -on -one, shoot some shot. No one would blink twice, right? But instead, simply moves the basketball to the other side. And then he interchanges on top of it. Now watch, right? So these guys over here, all right, Dwight Howard, Pope, all right, Danny Green, they were on the weak side. Now they're the strong side. Now they're in the action. And now I want you to look at LeBron James and Anthony Davis, two of the best defenders on the planet. Every athletic gift freaks, unbelievable athlete defenders all time, all right? They just went from the strong side on the ball to the weak side. And look how lazy they are. LeBron's, you know, warming up his hands. He's thinking, I'm not involved in this. I was just on the strong side. I already did my job, all right? Anthony Davis, same thing. He's a little lazy. He's late to get in the paint. Jay Crowder, he's the one that initiated it. LeBron, he should be the X out guy. He should be taking this pass, but he was too busy doing that, right? All because of a simple swing pass. And guess what? I believe in basketball karma. You play the right way. You do the right things. It comes back to you. And the guy that swung it, he got the three. All right. One clip from um, our season this year. This was in preseason. All right. And this is kind of a little for the under 16 guys, you know, something like that right here. This guy boxing out, making this great fight. His name is Jordan Goodwin. All right. He was on an exhibit 10. He was trying out to make the team. He didn't make our team, but he know every one of us noticed the little things he did starting with this kind of box out. And you'll see the way he plays later. All right. He made an impression on us in preseason and the things that he did. All right. And then he ended up, we had an injury to our backup point guard, DeLon Wright, and he steps in and gets a contract in the NBA, right? Because he plays the right way. He's about the right things. He's a great kid that comes in every single day and works to get better. That doesn't go unnoticed, right? That type of behavior does not go unnoticed. And Jordan Goodwin is an example of that. So great box out right here. All right. Important thing, We're running, sprinting up the floor. We love kick ahead passes, right? Kick ahead passes are obviously unselfish. You are doing that for someone else to score, all right? This guy, Quentin Jackson, he got a two way too. He ended up being on our NBA team as well. He made an impression in the preseason too, right? He swings the ball. He could have gone one on one right there, right? This 433 in the fourth, he's only played, he's only been in since the five minute mark. He could easily go one on one and try to prove to everyone he's an NBA player. DeLon Wright, watch him. He made the kick ahead pass, he got the pass. Simple power of the swing pass. He moves it. Jordan Goodwin, he could go one on one. Said he gets off it under. We twist. Ball goes to the baseline, right? Automatic. We get anything going to the baseline. We kill cut. All right. And a lot of times you kill cut to open up this three for this guy right here, which he does. He could easily shoot this shot, right? But instead, he makes the one more back to the guy that started everything. Basketball karma comes full circle. We play the right way you get the rewards, right? That's how it goes. So that's kind of the um, kind of talk of how I, how I see player development and some of these like things connecting to the game, right? So these, this kind of way of playing basketball as, a, as an ethos, as a believing in doing thing, something for someone else and knowing how to space, how to be on the weak side, do something for someone else because 90 to 95% of this game you do without the basketball. But when you do get the ball, you need to be able to use your feet, have good footwork, have a good base, and then have your eyes to scan the floor to be able to make the right decision for your team. So um, hopefully that that made some sense and that's something. Um, I'm sorry I, I do talk too much. I went kind of long, but I'm, I have nothing but time. So um, if you guys, I'm open to let's do some question and answers. So. Um, uh, Zach, uh, awesome lecture, awesome lecture. <laughs> and um, yeah, if you want to open up the chat, um, if I sum it up, there are um, a lot of questions about uh, uh, teaching, teaching date details. And uh, I don't know if you want to uh, read the questions, uh, if you scroll up a little bit, um, or um, I can read it, or uh, maybe if... Um, like uh, the the guys who asked the question um yeah, yeah. no I'll, I'll start i think uh, i see simon bertram um so the way we kind of do it is try to do the way i like to look at it is you do block practice to introduce the skill 
right? So whatever it is we're teaching, whether it be the footwork, right? If we're talking about the certain footwork I talked about, we'll block it, we'll do it, you know, just feel it, get a few reps, understand what exactly I'm saying, what exactly I'm trying to get you to understand and do. And then we'll put a defender in, right? Then we'll build and we'll add a defender. And then that you have to, now I have to use that skill to get by this guy ultimately, right? So now I add this and I have to get by him. And then hopefully in a perfect, beautiful world and how this would happen, right? When we go to practice, we do some three on three or we do these, like I talked about, we have these, um, player development session at the beginning of practice where we have either positionally or um, in combinations with some bigs and others we do this like two on two or three on three usually against the coaches and the way we tend to do it because I mean I wish I could tell you this is great and these NBA guys are so excited to do this but a lot of times you know it's March it's you know we just played four games in five nights and they ain't having it like they don't want to do this stuff so what we do a lot of times and one of my favorite things is I'll have them do this technique and make the pass and make the read, make the decision. And then what we'll do is we'll throw them the ball and they go one-on-one -on -one against a coach. So that's one of my favorite things is I like going one-on-one -on -one versus a coach just for juice, for energy, for shit talking, you know, to like raise the intensity of it and just get them to, to like have some energy. And I think once they start doing that, they get more and more into it and they enjoy like, you know, playing, you know, I can't guard them, you know, but I try and they, you know, I'll, I'll talk trash if they miss the shot and we'll do it. So we try to do it with, you know, one on O, build it up to a defender, build it up to three on three and like perfect pie in the sky world. We do it five on five later, but usually that doesn't happen. Um, but that's what we try to do. You know, that's the, that's the goal that would, and you can kind of interleave different skills with it. So you're not doing the same thing over. There's so many people that are so much smarter at this stuff and these technical things than I am. I'm a dumb basketball coach. So I'm, I'm learning with you guys on these things. I think you guys like tactical periodization and, you know, block practice and all of this is new to me, man. I'm learning this and I'm all in and I'm so excited, you know, so I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm some kind of expert on this stuff. I think you guys, uh, you know, in Europe have, have a much higher level of understanding, you know, with the uh, football and soccer coaches, you know, that that's where a lot of the stuff is coming from. You guys are doing that at a high level. So I, I'm learning right along with you. I'm not acting like I got, I got all the answers, but that's, that's how we try to do it. Um, let's see, where are we at now? Ooh, good question. So, uh, Jens, I hope I'm sorry. I'm going to butcher everyone's name and pronunciation here. Um, Analytics are a big piece. Analytics are a big piece for us in the NBA, and we're trying to reinforce that daily. So with guys I work on, work with, we try not to shoot mid-range shots, but there's certain guys like Kristaps Porzingis, that's part of his game, right? And he has to shoot those shots. So where we try to avoid those with others, we'll use it a little in warm-ups and then let him rep and feel comfortable. But we're, we're really reinforcing the values of shots. I think that's just, it's understanding the context, right? Understanding these shots are more valuable than these other shots. And you would have to shoot this shot at this percentage to make it worth this shot. And so we're just kind of reinforcing that. And to me, it's just kind of like, like I talked about earlier, right? You are what you emphasize. So if I'm always having you shoot mid-range, you think that's important, right? So I don't do it unless he wants to do it, unless that's part of his warm-up then we'll do it. But otherwise, I'm just emphasizing the shots and the shot selection that we want as a team and as a franchise. And that's how we kind of try to um, build analytics into player development. Just, just as simple as that. You know, it doesn't have to be a long discussion about math or this or that. Just, hey, these are the shots I'm working on with you on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you start to understand, oh, I don't work on mid-range pull-ups. If I shoot a pull-up, it's a pull-up three. And if not, I go into that yellow zone and instead of just shooting my pull up, I hesitate, I create an advantage and now I go and pass. Because usually I think if you can shoot a mid-range pull up, you could keep driving or you could force help and create another pass. That's usually how I feel about mid-range pull ups. And obviously there becomes a shot clock, you know, an element to that. Anything under 10, we generally are okay with, right? Under 10 seconds, let's play basketball. Let's not overthink this shit. All right, let's just move the ball and get a good look for our team. Okay, Felix, talking about teaching techniques, do you use external cues and pictures like flipper traffic light on purpose? Yes, 
Amen. Uh, I'm as big on language, right? So I, I think I try to use the power of story and connection to help lock information into players' minds, right? I think sometimes we can get locked into technical jargon where we make a you know an easy game difficult and add layers to it. And I think our job is just to connect meaning to the players to get that to stick. So I think it's it's easier to remember stuff if there's something that you know helps it stick to you. And the traffic light or you know. You know, I always joke like we're using like you saw in the in the presentation, I use the eyes like the emojis via text, you know, as much as you can connect and meet players where they are players in this generation, you know, they're texting, they're using emojis rather than words. So, you know, let's use emojis. Let's do those things to meet them where they are. I don't understand it, but, you know, sure, it works for them. I'm not going to do a TikTok dance. That's for damn sure. But, you know, if if that's what they like, good for them. You know, maybe I'll show it or reference it. But um, it's just about, you know, trying to get something to stick in their mind. And whatever it takes to do that, we're going to use these language and pictures and metaphors to really drive that home. I'm big on that. And I'm big on only using three things, three words. Like, that's my thing is that if you can't do it in like three words to get something to stick, that's why I talked about refine and define, feet and fakes, you know, all these things to try to get it to stick in your head to like have sticking power. Um, let's see. Um, it's kind of skipping on me. I don't see. What do you think oh. are the body basics that support or improve foot and eye work? Whew, honestly, I don't know. That's where I would say I'm I'm not um, skilled enough and have a knowledge of, you know, biomechanical and um, though and, you know, that's where I'll, I'll defer to like our strength coaches and our medical staff. And if I have an idea, once again, I follow my curiosity, right? I have these ideas, and then I'll take it to someone that would know that because I don't know, I have no idea. So I'll ask someone and I, I think you're only as good as your questions sometimes. And you guys have some great questions for me. I'm not providing much in terms of answers, but you know, I'll try to take those questions to someone else and find a better answer. So uh, I don't know the body basics or what that makes other than it makes intuitive sense to me and to some of these things and um, all that. Okay, do you teach and correct the exact footwork when you teach touch or slip screens? Let them find the solution more or less. Yeah, that's a so uh, Michael, great question. Um, so talking about how we teach the footwork and the screening angles on switching versus having them find the solutions, it's been an interesting dilemma and debate for us. You know, we've been uh, kind of debating that a lot of the staff and how to teach it. So what we'll do is we'll do it once again. We'll do it block practice. We'll do it individually, and then we'll do it live, player on player where they got to find solutions. Now they know, hey, we're switching. So now they're going to really work to get underneath and not let them switch. And now they got to find creative and novel situations where maybe they come up and they flip the angle at the last second. Like we call that Anderson Verizal. Verizal, one of the best, you know, at flipping the angles of screens ever, right? So we, we talk about maybe you find a solution on your own of flipping the screen. Maybe instead of touching and rolling under, you sprint and slip out. But we want them to keep finding solutions on their own and um, we'll teach them the technique and then we'll just try to play live two on two three on three out of it to get them to find solutions and then maybe we, that's when you layer in right you put a coach in the weak side and they got to run this pick and roll and if i show my hands or i say blue you got to make that pass and now something else happens and now we got to trigger another advantage in a different way but um, honestly, I'm learning and growing in that as much as possible. I think there's a lot of great literature and people talking about those things that I'm trying to integrate in my own. I'm right there with you trying to ask these same questions. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of a similar question. Um, same on block practice. Like I said, learning, trying, um, trying my best to figure it out as well. Um, favorite players for watching film for guards? Uh, I love Milos Teodosic. I think he solves the problems some of the best. Like if you want to watch European guards, I think Teodosic is great. And I think um, uh, Nick Kalathis, two of the guys I showed. I think Luka Doncic has the best pick and roll footwork of anyone. And I think, like I said, you watch, he does skips. He does all of it. He changes speeds. He uses ball fakes. You know, I think he does everything you'd want. So watching Luka is important too. Um, the guys I had watched in the past were Chris Paul, 
And especially he's gotten older. He's still doing stuff, you know, that he's done uh, before. Chris Paul is fantastic. Um, yeah, those are kind of the main ones. Uh, um, Tyrese Halliburton is doing a really good job lately. You know, I think Tyrese Halliburton is a great one. He's a really clever pick and roll player and really good passer. So I think watching some of the things he does um, is great. And what would I teach to an under 14 guard? Honestly, like someone's asked me this before and everything I teach to an NBA player, I teach to a U14 player, right? I don't think they're, I think the way I teach and the way I work is the same. I think it, you know, I think my job is to help people understand things at a base level. And if I can't explain it to a U14 guy, then I shouldn't be teaching a, an NBA player that. Right. That's our job is to distill this down as simple as possible and get people to understand these concepts. So and I think they're so simple. Like, I don't think there's anything like from a biomechanical or like they can't do this. Like it's just a principle of creating space and using space. So I think all those things I would use to a U14 player as well um, and understand. Ooh, perfect. One of my favorite. I didn't I didn't mention this. Uh, I am the biggest lean into your strengths person, right? So two examples of this, like uh, Joe Ingles goes left every time. Everyone in the world knows he's going left. Find a bunch of solutions to if people send you right to get back to your left, right? That's your strength. You are elite at going left. Why would you do the defense a favor and go right? You know, and same thing. That's what I'm trying to do to Denny Avdia is, you know, everyone's talking to him. He's very strong. Same thing, very right-hand dominant. And I'm just like, go right every time, make them stop you. That That's just where I stand. Like, if you're really good and elite at something, lean into that. Do more of your strengths, do less of your weakness. That's kind of the refine and define thing, you know? And maybe I'm a little strong and black and white on that, but that's just kind of how I've always been, is like, what's our strength? And do it over and over and over again, because we're good at it. Like the, I know you guys don't like the NFL as much, but they used to talk, uh, you know, Vince Lombardi, was the a famous coach in the United States of a, the Green Bay Packers, right? And they talked about his playbook. He had three plays and he ran the Packers sweep over and over. He's like, I'm gonna run it till they stop it. Right. So I'm a big believer. If you score on something, run it again. Run it again. Stop it. I dare you. Like we can get cute and overthink things as coaches. You know, we we make this game a lot more difficult than it has to be. You know, let's keep it simple and put put our players in the best positions to be successful and have them do it over and over and over again. That's just kind of how I see it. So um, let's see, pick and roll dance. Bring the same line in front of the else. Yeah. Um, you know, it's so the question was the pick and roll dance, right? And that's that's kind of the thing is there's different solutions to different coverages, right? And and also like everything's not gonna be the same every time, right? So it's about having different solutions and having the ability to read. Maybe there's a really good defender on your guard. And you set a step up screen, you set a flat pick and you held it, right? I can't be on the same plane. So now I have to have a different solution, right? And as a guard, I have to know he just set a great screen. Now it's my time to get downhill, you know, versus understanding when the big slips out. Like, so a lot of times we talk about having a wide base. And as soon as we face that, uh, force that defender to go over the screen, we're running to the rim and we're trying to put pressure on the rim. So hopefully we stay in that same plane, but at the same time, we have Bradley Beal right? One of the best off the dribble, pull up mid range artists in the world, right? So sometimes we have to set a great screen for him and let him be him, right? So it's kind of understanding your player's strengths, understanding, you know, your defender, understanding the coverage, right? There's no, there's no simple answer to that. You know, it's, it's, that's what makes the game so much fun is there's the chess match of there's so many layers and so many elements of ways you can improve and ways you can read and flow within a game. Right. You see, like for us, it would be we see something like, all right, go bears back. Let's turn, flip, hold screens, release, um, you know, release Brad downhill because they're mainly playing this pick and roll two on two. So we're not going to get many good looks against Rudy. He's one of the best drop bigs in the world. Let's try to get these pull up threes, some pull up twos and release Brad, our best player downhill on him. Right. So that that's the dance is also us as coaches. That's where, you know, we talk about exactly in the huddle we're using triggers to say hey this is how we're being guarded let's do it and a lot of times we'll show them film that's the beauty like in the nba we're very lucky to be able to show real-time film and we'll go in a huddle and be like look this is how they're guarding you in pick and roll we want more of this all right set it hold it release him 
Or maybe we're going, hey, we're not getting good looks out of that, right? Let's try to stay in the same plane. Let's change the angles of our screens and let's get our rolls out and try to trigger some weak side help and get some threes. So it's not just, just Brad shooting pull-ups. Yeah, so the Simon asked, um, how do you develop a PDP for a player? Is there a blueprint you can use? Um, I think, like I said, the first step is getting to know the player. I don't think, I don't think it's wise to immediately just go in guns a blazing and saying, this is how I'm going to change you and make you this player. I think it's a, it's a process where you sit back, you observe, you watch, you listen, and you see what the player is telling you. You see what they're showing you from a skill standpoint. Like, cause it's like, I can see a player on tape, but until I meet him in person, until I get to know him as a person, understand him. And maybe a guy is, you know, uh, obstinate and doesn't want to work on this or has a thing like, no, this is my game. This is what I do. You know, you're like, oh, well, maybe I don't want to come with an aggressive player development plan that is working against him and there's friction, right? So it's, there's no, like, there's no cookie cutter formula. It's just getting to know a guy. And then having a plan, like I said, just having like, so seeing him, getting to know him and then having a dialogue with him. Hey, this is where I see you going forward. This is, I, this is the path that I see you walking. If you do these things correctly, I see you going here eventually. So let's work together and develop this together and communicate this together on where we can go. Decision-making, would you say it has to always be a kill cut? Even the situation would be better to stay outside. Why would you choose the one or the other answer? Yep. So we actually had this debate um, with one of our players, um, Ish Smith, last year. Very quick, lightning quick point guard. Um, he is. He ends up, uh, we call it gnashing. You know, when you drive along the baseline um, in a pick and roll, you keep your dribble alive. Like Wayne Gretzky used to go behind the net. Steve Nash, fellow Canadian, like to go underneath the basket and keep his dribble alive, okay? So we call that gnashing. So when, when he goes on that baseline, Ish wanted the guy to hold. He was asking your question. He's like, I want to have an outlet. And our, our thing was we just kill cut every single time because it's good for spacing and it puts a lot of pressure on the defense, right? We want pressure on the rim. And I think almost every time the kill cut's the right decision. You know, the only, the only thing that you could talk about is if there's a big in the dunker rather than someone spaced in the corner, right? If there's someone in the dunker, then I see your point, right? That kind of creates this little gray area on that. I prefer to have black and white solutions for players and to keep it simple and then let them play and let them find other solutions, right? Because if you're always kind of giving them gray, well, if this, then this, if this happens, then maybe you could do that. Then I feel like there's paralysis by analysis. And if we just give them simple solutions, like, hey, Ball goes baseline, you cut, all right? And then when something happens that that doesn't make sense, well, we can talk about it then. But I like keeping it simple for guys and letting their brilliance shine. And sometimes, like I said, players will show you. Maybe the player will show you a better idea. Like, oh, shit, maybe we shouldn't do that, but we should do this. Hope I, I think I got everything on everyone. Yes, yes. So, Zach, uh, thanks a lot. Before we go back to Coach Bauermann, uh, for some words, um, I would like every uh, everyone to fill out uh, the online feedback sheet. Um, it's a German, but uh, it doesn't matter. You can fill out in German and use Google Translator to fill it out in English. So it helps, uh, helps us um, to get better as a federation uh, for further um, online clinics like this awesome one you did. Okay. Dick. Yeah, well, um, Zach, I, I thought it was uh, extremely informative. Um, I couldn't thank you more. I think for the coaches and uh, our under 16 players, I think what stood out was uh, the passion that you have for the game and our responsibility as coaches um, to teach and to mentor and to help our players to become the best version of themselves. And then secondly, um, great attention to detail, which I think is extremely important, not just offensively, but also defensively. So uh, thank you for a job, extremely well done. 
Uh, it was an honor for us as German coaches to have you. And uh, we wish you nothing but the best, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot again. Um, so now we are finished. Um, have a good have a good night. Uh, it's uh, 10 p.m. here. Um, like Coach Bauman said, awesome, extremely informative. Um, I hope we uh, can do this more. And uh, yeah, great, uh, Zach. I would like uh, to ask you to stay a few more minutes uh, for uh, Coach. Bauman. Bauman, Peter, and me, and um, yeah, thank you uh, for uh, every coach uh, who was attending that online clinic. Uh, good night and see you.